Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Amira Hall, and she's going to tell us about her near-death experience. Hi, <laughs> it's nice to have Hi, you here. Peggy. We were just Thank chatting so beforehand much. and just got lost in where we were at. <laughs> yeah, we got on a roll, didn't we? Talking about some of the maybe the nuances uh, behind the scenes that a lot of NDEers gloss over. In, in their real everyday life, trying to trying to reintegrate after the NDE. Yeah, that's that's been my journey is trying to reintegrate and and keep upping my game. You know, I think after having that opening, that spiritual trigger, or maybe it was a an explosion in my case of of opening not only my psychic senses, my spiritual abilities and aptitude, but integrating that in like what does that mean and how do I apply it in everyday life? I want to go around and say. Yes, what is love, love is, there is, as that was one of the messages that I received is that love is the fabric of all creation and it exists in absolutely everything. And I still struggle with trying to wrap my head around what do you mean this, this playing card has is love or this iPhone is love and this microphone is love all of it and so then that becomes like well how can how can that be and just sort of tr maybe over analyzing it keeps us stuck right rather than right. being in that flow right i know <laughs> i know exactly what you there, mean. Right? do you want to yeah. give us your story so they'll know what we're talking about yeah here? okay so where do i begin um i you know before my nde i almost had a, a face with death I came up face to face like I had a choice and it was over a medical diagnosis. So what happened for me was uh, my dad died. I went through divorce and then I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And that was back in 1991. So our medical system definitely lumped anything that related. They're still doing it today. Emotional exhaustion or, um, you know, the chronic fatigue, the autoimmune system breakdown, they lump that into a few diseases right so yeah it almost sounds like an adult failure to thrive i'm sorry say that again it sounds to me like an adult failure to thrive you know a baby can born with failure to thrive or an elderly person they have failure to, they, they uh just fail to be here like they're they just don't have the will to live and i think you know sometimes we can get in such emotional turmoil that we're just not thriving i mean you had do you say they they thought yours was um, like from emotional stress and well, it wasn't until I went through a number of doctors that basically told me to go home and prepare my uh, affairs that you know I had a choice death or wheelchair. And so I think that diagnosis definitely was you know debilitating and I fell into a deep 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 depression until I found an internist that actually told me that I had emotional overload and I needed to heal my emotions. And it was so interesting because it took a decade later before that message came back to me, but in my NDE. So I'll get to that point, but those do that doctor helped me out. And that's when, you know, I, I find it so poignant because here we are faced with health crises all around us right now. But for me, 30 years ago, I was directed to alternative health. I had to dig my way out. I had no support system. There was no internet. Going back to organic you know, understanding how my body and my digestion works and what I needed to do for me to thrive, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think at the core level of our, you know, is our uh, nutrients and how can, can we support a healthy mindset if we're not eating right, right? So our whole system depends on that, the foundational level. So I began thriving. I, I was doing all the things. Way back then, I began doing system detoxes. Twice a year, I discovered that I needed to do a 30-day detox. And we're talking organic food. We're talking juicing. We're talking colonics. We're talking big time, heavy duty. You know, And people thought I was an absolute weirdo right? But I had no choice in my, in my mind that I was here to thrive. 
So that continued and I got better and I got stronger and more curious. And I started making the best money that I had ever made in my life. And so I felt something missing. There was something missing in my life. And that's when I was drawn to a, to go to The first one was Peru. So I went to the jungle. I was working with a shaman and a small group of people. I did have an ayahuasca experience that gave me an, a vision of myself as a star seed, which I didn't know what that was in 1997. I didn't know what a stargate was. I wasn't a Trekkie. I wasn't into any of that. You know, I was a straight little corporate sales executive <laughs> doing my job and, you know, just living a good life or what I thought was a good life. And so I go down there and I'm in the jungle in the Amazon and I see myself shooting like a comet through this star system that was called a stargate. And then the window closed after I came to this place that was around Egypt area that I needed. I, I came there in early, early, early Egypt, which I didn't get timelines. I didn't get a year or anything like that. And the, when the window closed, it was like my family on the other side. And I felt this immense love and I, I was crying and, and just an, a really overwhelming sob of separation. And I struggled with abandonment and betrayal energies for a couple of days. And what that was, was it, the, the love that I felt was my star family. Again, it didn't, at the time it wasn't star family it was just this immense love but i you, i associate star with it because it was pure light what brought this on this was an ayahuasca uh, journey a uh, sacred journey with plant medicine in uh peru and so in that the moment i i knew, were these supposed it's, to cause it's a ritualist it's a ritualistic um, ceremony that the shamans prepare. They pray over the roots of these plants uh, for 10 days. So at the time, now this has become a very commercialized process for a lot of people doing it. And a lot of people just doing it for a, a rush and a high. When I went to Peru, I had no clue what this was. <laughs> I just went because I was being guided to go. Okay. And so this it's, it's a psychedelic. It's um and it's meant to, for some people, um, it's it's extremely traumatic. And the I personally, I don't put any, um, yeah, anything into drug induced, right? Experience. Well, well, I guess mean. what? I don't either. And so after that, and there, like I said, there's a huge fad and, and a lot of people want to do this to accelerate their spirituality. And I'm opposed to that. And um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I, I did it. And what was really incredible was during that ceremony, also, there was this gray smoke that came out of my sixth chakra, my, my third eye, my, my connection to God. And I understood there was someone else that I was working with, call him a demon. He called himself a shaman. A yeah, spiritual these, I'm sorry, these experiences came from drug use, correct? That it, it's, it's called a plant. It is a plant. I mean, it's called, I mean, they do this for people to have these experiences, right? This is a shamanistic journey for spiritual connection to other worlds. I didn't know that going When somebody the, else called getting high. Well, it's not getting I mean, high there. Um, okay. So there is a difference. Okay. And I really want to emphasize that because I was on a spiritual pilgrimage. I was not going there to get high because that's not who I am. And, and this is a, it was preyed on the shaman is takes this highly, very serious. This is not, this is very, there were like three or four shaman praying on us and it's, it's a highly sacred ceremony that is not meant to be commercialized like a lot of people do and just to go get high. No, no are this they, is not are these expensive all. like trips or? Oh, it was a journey to Peru. So we oh. went through, you know, the Machu Picchu, we went through everywhere. Yeah, I don't but know. But I mean, like somebody has a ceremony, like you pay them to have. It was all part of the journey, but you know, hey, we went to Lake Titicaca and we had ET experiences there, um, not like, 
like I, I, I'm going down another rabbit hole here, but <laughs> that wasn't, it's not like you, 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 you go there because of the heightened energies and because of the altitude, I also believe, and because of the sacredness of the land and the connection of the people to the land, there is a higher vibration of, and, and, affinity with spirituality it's not the christian mindset that we've all been introduced to i was raised catholic it was nothing like any of that but in 1997 i was guided to in into a different experience and it's not like i was looking for that and i signed up for it for that reason i was going on a sacred spiritual journey and so I started getting these bits of information that I had no clue of. It was way off my 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 wheelhouse, right? And so when when I had that experience, I knew I needed to go to Egypt was my next trip, the next spot on the journey to learn more about our spiritual world. And how do you hear and, about these trips? These well, I didn't know. Again, this was before the internet. So a friend gave me a flyer for this Peruvian trip. And in fact, I believe Oscar Miro Quesada, who guided, who was the American shaman who connected us to the Peruvian shaman, he will be speaking at the IANS. Do you, are you familiar with the IANS um, conference? He will be a guest speaker at the next conference. And he was the shaman that guided my tour in 1997. Yeah, I'm just not sure why Ions is going that direction, but that's up to them. Well, because there's there's other aspects to understanding when we cross when other information that is starting to be discussed. And I think to have an open mind for it to go, wow, like, look, I don't go looking for uh, drug situations. And in my situation, so the next year I found myself in Egypt. And I'm, I was just buying beads for my, my uh, jewelry. I was a jewelry designer at the time. And I wanted these antiquities that were found in the, in the area of the small town outside the Valley of the Kings. And so I had extended an incredibly wondrous, spiritually activating journey through Egypt. It started to, my heart opening, my understanding of, of, uh, connecting with the unseen world in a whole new way with reverence with open-mindedness again it wasn't super strong but it, it started shifting me i started seeing things that i wouldn't normally see and that's with nothing there's you know i ate my regular meal that was all i all we took you uh -huh. know and egypt is not an alcoholic uh, country, you know, the only place you could ever have an alcoholic beverage or a beer is even in the hotels. So it's not a country that even they're, they're frown on alcohol. Okay. So you don't even have that. Okay. To say, oh yeah, I was high from, you know, 10 beers or something. No, 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 no. So I go to this, this small little factory where I had to go back the second day to pay for these beads. These guys were selling me. It was a friend of a friend. So when we, when you go in Egypt, the custom is that you have a cup of tea or you have a Coca-Cola, but you sit and visit. It's not a, here's your money transaction. And you walk out the door. There's this whole social, you know, talking about your home. They talk about their kids or they introduce you to things and it's getting to know you time. Well, they brought out a joint and I said, thank you, but I don't smoke. Okay. I had enough of experience a year before with Peru, right? It's like, and so they started shouting, like I insulted them and they're screaming. It's the best. It's the best. And they're shouting in Arabic and English and Arabic. And, you know, Egyptians are very expressive, you know, even if they're shouting, they're not necessarily mad at you, but they're just like that, you know, kind of like Italians and they're waving their arms and Greeks. So there we are. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, I'm the only female here. We're in the Valley of the Kings in a little rinky dink little office of a factory. And I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? No, thank you. And I'm being polite. I don't smoke. I don't do this. And uh, so then I thought, oh, geez, this is getting crazy. So I think I better acquiesce. It's never done anything to me. I've tried it a few times throughout my life. Didn't really phase me. I'm not. I don't have a propensity for that, right? What's it called? 
It was marijuana. It was oh, a joke. I said acquiesce or something. I I, 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 I thought, well, maybe I should acquiesce. I will let, I will surrender. I will gracefully, um, you know, uh, you know, participate oh. because I never heard I, of that. I, I was, cre I was creating a, a scene here. Right. And this was becoming very uncomfortable. Fear me. pressure. Well, they weren't even my peers. They were Arab men, <laughs> you know, in a village. So I'm the only white chick. Right. And I'm American. Everybody You're the only female too, weren't you? Oh, that was yeah 22 23 <laughs> years ago so a little younger yeah um the thing of it was is they brought out the joint and like 10 guys showed up in the room so there were three of us before and all of a sudden these guys show up out of nowhere and they form this circle and the joint starts going around i thought okay well i'll shut i better be make muhammad quiet you know, See, i'm having anxiety just that picture in my head oh, of being in a it was country, stressful the it only was... female and all these men come in and circle around you i'm like freaking out right now <laughs> well they were in a circle they were they were polite they keep their distance it wasn't like they were you know hoarding around me or anything but you know it was still a situation that most people don't consider like okay what do i do here right i want to be safe I, I've tried it, never affected me before. Like I, I get more of a buzz from a from a light beer, right? So I don't want the pot. I don't smoke. I didn't like any of that. So I thought I'll just say okay. So because it was his generosity, his hostly, you know, generous offer that I was insulting, not the fact that it was pot or anything. So the joint starts going around and it passes me. I inhale, it goes around again. It went around twice and everybody jumps up and they're ready to walk out the door. Well, I can't get out of my chair and they're kind of looking back and they're kind of wondering and I'm still frozen there. And I'm like, I can't move. I'm in the only plastic chair in the room sitting there and I, I find myself standing outside of myself. And I can see myself going back and forth. And I go, I've got to stay in my body. I have to stay here. I want to stay here. Somehow I must have put my hands out. I don't remember, or I never heard myself say, I need water. But I remember doing this. And I remember my friend walking towards me. Meanwhile, what I could see of the people in the room was like a movie. Like I was watching, you know, 20 television sets with different movies playing. So I had my hand out and I'm watching all this going, you know, didn't know what to make of it. And I want to stay in my body. I want to stay in my body thinking if I could just get water on my face, splash my face, it'll keep me, you know, present. Well, I got to this point and I thought, oh shit, this is going to make my mascara run. <laughs> You know, total chick moment, right? Vanity. I always talk it up to my, you know, French Canadian blood, <laughs> my vanity. So, um, no, that's a funny moment in my mind, but I was gone after that. I, everything blocked out. They told me I fainted or I passed out on the floor. My body stiffened. They told me they were pounding my chest with all their might. And then they dragged me out from under the arms and loaded me into a pickup truck. Well, they tried to get my heart, re re they, they told me later, the heart stopped and my breathing stopped. So they were dragging me out, taking me in the back of, a, I was in the pickup in the front, in the cab. So those pickup trucks are beat up old, small little pickup trucks. The bed of the pickup truck has benches on the side because it's a village taxi, right? People oh. just jump up on the on the back and they get a ride to wherever they're going. In the cab, I was- Sounds like Southeast Ohio to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, like I said, it was primitive, okay? my They propped me up on the passenger side of the cab, but they've got my head out the window and they're driving down the road. And that's when I started to- that the net, the phase that I remembered after passing out at the time was that I was like a light beam or a laser light or a comet, a phase of light shooting through the cosmos. And I didn't know, I was just pure light. And I could see the earth, 
It was way off in the distance. I knew I was going towards that blue ball. And then I got closer and closer. And the next thought was, it's so big. How am I going to find myself? And the next moment I hear this language that I did not understand and didn't know where I was. So it was literally like, you know, a rock falling close to earth and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, ready for this, you know, connection. And then the, then immediate, oh, that's Arabic. Oh, Egypt. And it was like, that was like a little GPS to find myself in my body. And then the next step was trying to get in my body felt like a 20 minute endeavor. Have you ever put on wet clothes? Yeah. How sticky and cold and hard it is. It's a real, it's not just like sticking your legs in the pants and you know, you gotta, you know, really work it. Right. That's what it was like to get into my body. That's the closest thing that I can describe. And it, it felt like I was struggling to get back into the body uh, as a spirit. And so then I remember sort of hearing the noise in the, in the cab of the truck and the, all this Arabic shouting. And I touched my friend's lap and said, you know, gently, I couldn't open my eyes. The light was incredibly bright. It was just so like instantly so bright. And I equate that now to me trying to get in the body. So as a spirit, there was no brightness, but as the, it coming into my spirit, coming into the body, there was all of a sudden that disruption or this awareness, this new level of awareness. And I asked my friend, where are you taking me? Because the next level of awareness I had was my bowels are going to burst <laughs> and I need a bathroom. And, and uh, he said, shouted in Arabic. And then he realized, oh, I need to speak English. She doesn't speak Arabic. And it was like the hospital. And my thought was, oh shit, a hospital will kill me. And I'm like, I can't go to no hospital in this primitive part of the world. <laughs> I mean, just the germs walking in the place will probably kill me. I don't know. I had this crazy thought. And um, so you were like in the cosmos one minute and then like talking to them. Yeah, and Exactly. And, and I was and in pure bliss. I was in such bliss, but I needed a bathroom. <laughs> and so they, they knew, but I didn't know that I couldn't walk. And so they, they, they after in some Arabic negotiations, they figured out, see the I'm next sorry, big I'm problem. I'm just seeing a headline. <laughs> and the ear needs potty break training the ear. <laughs> <laughs> after we die, apparently the very first thing is there's a big release, right? the body begins to release from various areas, okay? That's uncontrollable. You can't control that anymore. And that was the only, that was the real factor later on that I needed that I had a death experience. My body stopped and it was letting go of all the crud. But the big problem was they were trying to find a bathroom for me because in the Middle East at the time, and still today, in a very small villages, there is no Western toilet. There was no place where I could sit down. They have holes in the ground and they have two little foot markings that might be somewhat porcelain or even just rocks and you've got to squat. So <laughs> how's this lady going to do the bathroom when she can't stand up <laughs> or sit down? <laughs> so that became the next dynamic of trying to figure out what are they going to do with this person. The other thing is the year before there was a mass shooting at this temple called Queen Hatshepsut. And I believe there were something like 31 or 32 uh, Europeans that were gunned down by a madman. And so there was a law put in place that if anything happened to any American, I'm not sure if this uh, also reached the Europeans, but if anything happened to an American, they would all be thrown in jail. They would lose their livelihood and their whole family would be struggle terribly. Just if it was an American, like if it was somebody else. <laughs> right. Well, past. because they have made some, they have made some agreements to protect the tourists that were coming over, right? They wanted the tourism to continue, but they needed to have that 
factor in place. So this was now also an underlying factor for them and their need to make sure that I was really well taken care of. So there was a lot of issues that were sort of percolating in everybody's minds at the time, right? It wasn't just, oh, she died. No, they were thinking of themselves probably and what they needed to do to You're save bad for business. <laughs> <laughs> well, and livelihood, we're talking, I don't know, hundreds of people because each family, you know, all the men work and there's, yeah. So it's not like America. So there I was, then they had to carry me up three flights of stairs. <laughs> All the men were not toilet. like America. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and, and then this was 24 years ago. So, you know, we, you know, things have improved and changed, but, you know, it was rugged and there I was. I, I finally convinced them to take me to a toilet. They finally figured out that their brother his brother had renovated his apartment, his flat, and there was an American European toilet there. So they carried me up these three flights of stairs and brought me into the bathroom. And that's another uh, drama because women and men are not allowed in the bathroom together. So my friend was a male and I didn't want him to leave my side. I'm in a long dress and I put my skirt down around my legs and I'm thinking, well, I'm proper. <laughs> I'm being polite, meaning I'm, meanwhile, I'm just completely in a bliss state and he's sitting on the bathtub edge and he's tears are just streaming down his face because I'm calm and I'm in this just so happy and happy I got a toilet and on and on and and he's crying and a woman's pounding on the door screaming in Arabic I don't know what's going on he says you don't understand Amira you died you died he goes your heart stopped he goes doesn't your chest hurt he goes I was pounding with all my might to get your heart going and your breathing stopped. You were not breathing. I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. And the other, you know, drama was that being that I'm a woman and this man was unmarried and in the bathroom with me, this Arabic woman, his sister-in-law thinks we're having sex in there. Okay. This is where their mindset goes. <laughs> so it was just, it was one drama after another that was being created. Right. I really created a reputation for myself there. <laughs> so after, you know, that whole, he escorted me to the bedroom because I couldn't walk. I laid down and then they brought me water. They brought me yogurt. They brought me fresh juice, uh, orange cut up. They had the sense that I was dehydrated. I know they did. They must've seen something like this before because one, I had been detoxing for 30 days oh. before I went on my Egyptian trip. So my system, not having, having gone through this incredibly spiritually activating and awakening in, for two weeks throughout Egypt, which was incredible, lots of meditation, lots of prayer, connection with, you know, the ancient traditions. Does that detoxing um, include fasting? Yes, I was fasting for uh, one week, completely juices, but three weeks prior to that was all organic. Um, so I had done that before I went to Egypt also. And so coupled with all those aspects, and then me, you know, doing this, um, in the heat of the day in, the, in Egypt, they probably had seen other people have dehydration. Well, when she I came have this home, health condition. I thought maybe that was true. And so, you know, on when I came back, I, I went and had a complete physical. And my doctor told me, he goes, the only thing that looks off here is you've got some aminos that are low. Because I had mostly been vegetarian at the time. And you know, I say mostly because I think after the fasting, I started having a little bit meat. Um, but he said, Amira, do you realize that there's countless deaths every year from dehydration? And so I wasn't aware of that. So it could have been easily, you know, the factor of that hyper spiritual journey that I've been on, the fasting, me being super sem sensitive to any kind of drug hit period, you know, I don't even take, I get sicker from antibiotics than the antibiotic gets me better. I'm just hypersensitive. So um, 
all of that. Yeah, I, I want to say something there. I have noticed that a lot of MD ears are hypersensitive. Yes. To medications and allergens and all kinds of things. Yeah, and I rarely take like if I if it gets so bad a Tylenol or something, you know, half a Tylenol. Um, but taking a yes. Tylenol for me is like taking a Valium. What's that? Taking a Tylenol is like taking a Valium. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. It's just like I get all right. stress reduced. I don't know. Yes. And and the other thing that um, a lot of studies have about near-deathers have revealed is how super psychic or spiritual healing abilities that uh, NDEers um, exhibit after the fact. Um, and that was definitely me. I was always very sensitive in terms of awareness emotionally. I, they call it clairsentient. I was always picking up feelings and the vibe of rooms and people before things happened telepathically. I was already communicating with my loved ones who have crossed to the other side. You know, all of those uh, symptoms were happening. But, but over the years, I closed it down because I ridiculed, you know, being raised in a Catholic family and nobody believed in that or encouraged it. So I had shut off those super sensitive um, side to me, you know. And so this, I believe, whatever the combination of everything that happened, totally blew open what they call the sixth chakra. My pineal gland triggered that. And after coming home, so that day I had to travel, but I'm starting to see in the armoire, in the wood grain of the armoire, this goddess, and I have her here on my desk now, because this is the goddess Sekhmet. She has a lion's head, but a female's body from an ancient deity. And at the time, you know, I never really resonated with that. I thought, oh, it's a nice story, right? It didn't feel real to me. It was just the Egyptian story. Well, I started seeing her very much alive when I looked at the wood grain in the armoire. So there was a window to my right. I remember there's these very light curtains and they were blowing. The window was open. They were fluttering in the room. And I kept looking out to the green Nile Valley going, I'm going to look out there because that's real. That isn't real. And I kept, I kept going like I'm losing my mind. But this continued. I continued to see things that other people didn't see. And, you know, I flew from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo to New York, just that, the flight from New Cairo to New York is, a, I think it was eight or nine hour flight. And so all of the waiting time and transfer time. Can't and stuff, do that stuff. It didn't stop. And so what happened is sleeping on the plane, getting off in JFK, I saw all the people in the airport as walking paper dolls. They were black and white paper dolls. And all I could sense was anger and fear and grief. And I'm like, I don't want to come back to America. This is horrible. This is just an ugly, horrible place to be. Now, looking back and having done a lot of research myself and an exploration, I realized I was in a dimension of perhaps you call it grief, anger, despair, uh, depression. Do you think that and thought was laced? No, I think that energy exists right now on our planet. And I was in that dimension. That's what I think. Okay. Now, it could have been laced. I'll never know. What's the point? You know, and a lot of people say, man, you really went on a trip, Amira. It was that great pot. No, it doesn't last 24 hours. It doesn't last you, for nine months. Stop breathing. You know, they had to pound That's on your right. chest. I mean, you know, so a lot of factors are in that component, you know, sort of the whole formula there. But again, a lot of people want to know what happened, all the nitty gritty details. For me, the most important part was coming home. I was different. And I had to figure out my way through this darkness and get out of this. I was looking at a book because I'm like, I can't look at these people. And it wasn't for some time I realized I was looking at the book upside down. I couldn't read it. I was just so freaked out. With Did you think he's having around. a mental breakdown? Call it what you want. Um, I came home. I wasn't the same. I fired everybody. Yet I felt the same. You fired but, everybody? 
my friends, my family, my hobbies. I soon got fired from my job. So everything went to hell and I couldn't function. So I started going to different healers and psychics. I didn't dare go see a psychologist. I think they're going to lock me up and throw away the key saying I'm a crazy person because this is in 1998. You know, there's no internet. There's nobody talking about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I went the, I went the alternative. We're a special route. kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what happened was I went to different psychics to my dismay. They all told me something different. And I'm like, you people are a lot of help, you know, and it made me even more upset. <laughs> That's when I finally got the message that I had to figure it out. And when I finally came across a healer that said, Amira, you've got stuck energy. I went, hallelujah. I got a solution. Tell me how. And that's when I started the journey of just clearing my energy field. And that's what I show people today is how to clear their energy field. Because all depression is, is stuck energy. You know, to me, it's such a simple, simple, straightforward solution. When we clear the stuck energy, that's when our natural spiritual abilities come into alignment. And we do what we're here to do. And we can hear God, we can hear the angels, we can communicate freely. Our heart is open. And we know we listen to those spiritual guidance from beyond whatever you might want to call it, um, to the doing the right thing for each of ourselves. I think you know? depression, everybody thinks they have to dig themselves out. But I think we have to dig down deeper we're in depression and explore it and not be afraid of work. We're, we're so consumed with, I got to dig myself out of this. I got to get out of this that we don't stop and just experience it and be okay. And because I think there's artistic abilities and psychic abilities within that. Absolutely. Thing. What, what I learned is I can have waves of depression that hit me like a, like a tsunami and I'll go, that's not my energy because I know my frequency now. That's what I teach people how to do is discern their energy from someone else's. So when, when we do that, um, you can feel it and you know it's foreign. It's to you. And so once you have a tool or a way to identify it or release it, it's so easy. It's like, you know, pushing a button of gravity and just go whoosh. Like, why... Why should we, like, what if it was that easy? Why should we have to dig and work so hard? What if it was like that and let go? Yeah. It could be, you know, we, we as humans, we like to make things harder because then we've put some effort into it and then we can prove our worth. <laughs> you know, I think that it can be that easy. And that's what I strive for is, being more in alignment with the divine, the creator, because I know I'm created in that likeness. I'm here to create. So how do I best create? I best create when I'm in a flow, not when I'm resisting. Right. If I'm feeling exactly. depressed, there's some resistance. If I'm angry, there's some resistance. And if somebody triggers me, it's not them. We got fingers pointing out. There's three pointing back, right? It's within my frequency, something that I can contain and control. So I get to explore or just go delete, you know, right. and release it. And I love that because I don't have to go down the path of traditional psychology of going like, where did that begin? I mean, I can identify it on a timeline. Because in my after, so here's what happened. Me struggling in nine months in this total dark, desperate place, I was miserable. Well, I go to this book expo of America because I want to write about this story, right? And back then, I mean, everybody looked at me like I had three heads. They thought I was a weirdo. This is never going to be a good book. Da, 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 da. Yeah, just how you died is like set you up right there. Yes, you're right. And that's one of the reasons I didn't talk about it because I was judged. Oh, you druggy, you know, or you dumbass, you did some <laughs> stupid shit when you were traveling, you know, who does that? <laughs> well, adventurous person, that's who. <laughs> no. And so um, 
so yeah, they just frowned on me. Anyways, I'm schlepping all these free books because every single booth gives you their book, right? And I, my back was about to break. I remember meeting Louise Hayes. Because you don't eat me. <laughs> What's that? Because you don't eat meat. You got to be a big girl like me. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I do eat meat. Don't get me wrong. So uh, grass fed, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I was meeting these people and they were just, you know, Carolyn Meese was at that convention. I don't know if you've heard of her and I'm witnessing some of these people and I'm not liking what I see. Let's just leave it there. And so I, I, I was falling apart and I needed a massage. I found some Chinese <laughs> massage place, right? And I know this sounds sketchy too, I right? just need a massage. <laughs> well, my, I, I, everybody, you got two or three canvas bags loaded with these great big heavy uh you know hardcover books that all these book you know I was like <laughs> I'm a little girl and what a reading I don't know what I need it's like hey they're free why not I feel so I manly it's... now that I put on weight as I got older being around women tiny like I used to be I feel like I'm the man like I take care of them because they're so tiny no. they fall over and they can't carry crap <laughs> they're so and fake and they don't Be eat <laughs> Beulah the buzzers going off here okay we're stepping into our feminine energy this is the new <laughs> vibe okay so I get this massage and this Chinese guy this little tiny guy's walking on my back and that's when, in a moment, it was almost like <clears throat> all this information downloaded and I saw everything when I went out of my body, where I went and what it was. But I had to go through all of those machinations. Like flashback. It was a flashback on steroids. And it all made sense. They told me they were taking me on a tour of the divine. My body disintegrated into this etheric golden light. And I was teleported, transported into this, what felt like a boardroom. And now you're talking about the experience you had. Yes, where I went and what happened in the information. Because for me, this was the real story. This was what was what I struggled so hard to find and get connection. Like, what was all this? Why? How come I didn't get to see Jesus? You know, you ripped me off. <laughs> That's how I was mad. I was so mad. <laughs> was like, Where's this tunnel of light thing, you know? And, and it was like, it was blocked from my awareness because there was too much for me to process. That's what I believe. There was too much physically going on. I had that spiritual trip that was mind-blowing pardon the pun and <laughs> you know there was just too much to to, to process it was a, a, literally a sensory overload so they told me that i was going there couldn't stay and i was and i entered this boardroom and it's funny because the number 12 showed up but i couldn't it was like it was in a way you didn't go around the boardroom counting all the bodies. I just knew there were 12 there. They were dressed like people. Well, they look like men with suits on. They were all matching. But the funny thing was the head opened like a teapot and the lid stood up of their head. And there was this glowing golden light at the top of their head. Is this a heaven experience? You could call it that. I was in a boardroom. That's all I knew that at that time I related it to this. I think it was probably an assembly place of the council of 12 because those glowing lights just shone into my head. They were all had these 12 glowing beams right into my head. And they told me whatever I wanted to know, whenever I needed to know I had access. It wasn't like I had to go anywhere. I just needed to connect to it. And the words later described to me what I perhaps entered because then I was tra tra transported to a, uh, a, a, an infinite hallway. I believe this was the hall of records. And so there were doors on either side of the hallway and it just went into infinity. And then I went into this, they said they, I could go into any door but I couldn't stay. 
I could go in, get and have that experience, but I couldn't stay. So I stepped into the first door on the right, it was a gold door. And stepping into that door, all I felt was this incredible warmth, this incredible vibration that felt to me like a moving, intense colors and patterns like a kaleidoscope. And the only words that came to me was, this is love. And this is the fabric of all creation. And it was constantly dynamic. You know how a kaleidoscope is always shifting. Yeah. And so, and they told me, and it was so like the mother's womb, just warm and just so incredible. This is the fabric of all creation. And then whoo, I was thrown out. Maybe that's what it's like to be born, right? From our mom's womb. And then we're just whooshed out. And it was almost, hey, that was rude. I wanted to stay here a while. <laughs> And then I was in the corridor again and I crossed the corridor. I stepped into a pink door, but this was different. This was an emerald opaque energy that I stepped into. And I said, what's this? And they showed me a timeline and they showed me my birth to where I was. And they showed me, it was almost like a quantum field of interdimensional dots of everywhere that I held on to emotions that were causing my challenges, my relationship, marriage problem, you know, my health issues and where I was struggling in the body. And they showed me that detoxing and especially detoxing of my emotions were key to manifesting what I wanted to create. And I knew in that minute that, that I came here to teach people how to detox. It's not limited to the physical body. It's, it's, it's everything. It's our emotions. It's our mindset, our belief system. And I need to manifest to first whatever learn. you want. Yes. Like I, mani I, I manifested you calling me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're muted. Hit the button. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't come in the snap of a fingers all the time. But the more I realize, the more in alignment I am, the more relaxed and accepting and in gratitude, the more up my heart's desires manifest with ease and grace. Yeah, because I believe we're here to create. I mean, I just hear that a lot, um, manifesting and, and those kind of things and um, well, we're creating every single day. Every time my husband buys a lottery ticket, I manifest that's the winning ticket, but it never is. <laughs> there again, you know, is it, is it your mind over your heart? Because when you get in alignment with your desires, they just show up. And so sometimes it's our head thinking that we want something, maybe it's to keep up with the Joneses, or maybe you want to win the lottery ticket, and it's going to do not necessarily something that's in alignment with you. I think everybody will really... win the lottery. I think it's just the general. I don't, I don't know. That's not something I focus on. I don't focus on it. It's just if you buy a lottery ticket, I mean, you, everybody that buys one hopes that they have a chance they're going to win. They don't think I'm going to buy this and I'm going to lose. I don't know. I mean, you're just talking about manifesting. Right. Well, I believe like, you know, we're manifesting with every, every moment. So, you know, are you manifesting your day to be struggle or is it, is it one of moving through it with grace and ease and joy? No, I can Compliment. manifest that I'm not getting older, but I look in the mirror in the morning. I'm like, I don't think I did anything. <laughs> well, I don't I'm know. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be 66 in 25 days. So I think people have told me that I'm looking younger in a lot of ways. And so I see signs of age. There's no question, but I think it has to do with our vibration. I think that as we clear and Hey, starting in the tummy and our digestion and how we're, how we're able to process, you know, some of our, our, our uh, programming, some of our fears, some of the lies we've been told growing up, things that aren't true. Um, as we realize and connect with that, I think the divine in us will um, shine. And, and, and that shining light, even if you do see a few more wrinkles, the light shines through that. And then it's almost like the wrinkles aren't even visible. 
oh, I don't care about that. We really. <laughs> Well, I just try to find examples for manifest. Do. Peggy, some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, you know, knowing what's in your heart and following your heart, being able to take steps and having the courage to do that when everybody else tells you, oh, that's a stupid idea, right? Uh, whether it's wanting to be an artist or follow the dream. You know, I have a client that I recently talked to of, you know, he was an older guy and he, he always wanted to make his living from his music and he had a regular job, but it wasn't until we started clearing all of these childhood blocks that he's actually making more money in his doing his uh, music gigs now than he ever, ever thought possible. So is that what you do? You teach people to manifest I teach people how to get in alignment with themselves, heal themselves, and manifesting is a result. Yes. I mean, I worked with a princess in the, in the Dubai royal family who found me. I didn't search her out. She found me. She, funny story, you know, her job as a royal princess is to produce an offspring, right? She had three children. She was told by the top medical teams that money could buy that she could never get pregnant naturally. Well, that's, that's, that's a kiss of death for a Royal family woman, you know? So that's how she did it. She had an IVF and she had this children. That, well, she had a fourth one and it failed. They founded me because they wanted me to do the energy clearing so that the next IVF that there was already scheduled and paid for would go without a hitch. Well, when I was called to the palace and started work with her, next thing you know, her husband's coming home early on Friday. And he's coming, like she said, in 15 years, he's never done that. All of a sudden, he's getting frisky and he's taking her into the guest room. And they're having these experiences that in 15 years, she never had. And I told what her. What princess said, are we talking about? Well, I'm not saying any names. Oh, okay. But she's one of the top three of the Dubai United Arab Emirates royal family and her husband was in charge of the police and the uh, internal affairs which means very high tight security so you can bet they did background checks on me before I went to the palace right I think that's important just for that is to verify and validate who I was and that I wasn't some crazy person so how long did you have to be with her to do this? Well, I did six sessions, I believe, six or eight sessions. But I remember after the fourth one, she's noticing all these changes in the behavior between her and her husband. And, you know, this woman never left her, her palace, right? Unless she went to another palace. Um, she lived a very, like a bird in a cage type of existence. Most Western women cannot relate to it. I couldn't when I was visiting her. Bottom line is she had no passion. She would go to, to bed with her kids at seven or eight o'clock. And that was it. That was her life. Unless there was some palace event. Well, within four weeks, she noticed all these changes. And I told her, I said, don't be surprised if you get pregnant naturally before you start the hormone therapy. And guess what? She did. She delivered a happy, healthy baby boy. And she found a passion. She began currency trading. She was up all night long doing all kinds of research and study. And she was creating a charity so that she could help children. And that was how she transformed her life. And uh, to me, that's pretty cool because for someone that's like a bird in a cage and feeling like you're contributing to the world and, and having an outlet that's, that's, you know, a reason to get up in the morning, that's really really, really valuable. So do so, you yeah. have a website or how do people yes. reach you? Yes, it's amirahall.com, www.amirahall.com. And, um, you know, I offer a free stress buster guided meditation. And that's the very first step that I show people. It's a free download and they can download it just to start releasing energy. Energies that they don't know are there, right? We don't know what we're carrying around with us that aren't us, but any foreign energies that need to be released so that our body, because I believe God programmed us perfectly and our system knows what to do. We just got to release the excess. And then our beautiful gifts, our spiritual at, uh, um, attributes, our abilities to connect with each other, 
and have these heartfelt experiences can all come forward, you know, but we have to heal ourselves first. So whether it's a person that's had an NDE and is struggling even to stay connected with that beautiful light that they've, they connected with, or if it's somebody that yearns to know about the light, you know, releasing our fears around the so-called, you know, events of over the last couple of years, you know, just that fear alone has traumatized everybody. So we need to re release that which we are not. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're so welcome. We're coming on and explaining all this to us. It's new to me. So um, I'm delighted. I'm I delighted. know a lot of people, you know, know about these things and live in these circles and this part of your language. And some of us, it's like, it's Greek, you know. Like <laughs> I get it. I get it. It was to me too at one time. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I like the thing when I started to see that everything was energy in my NDE, that that was the core issue for all of our troubles and all of our problems to me that was just the breath of fresh air and a perfect solution and an easy and quick one that's what i'm all for sign me up for the quick and easy right that works not some more bs you know we don't need any more of that along right. the way right yeah okay so yeah. that's it keeping it simple keeping it real you know okay. all right well thank you thank you peggy thank you so much for reaching out i really okay. appreciate it blessings to you sweetie